Hello, friends and listeners. Welcome to Truth, Lies, and Alibis, the true crime podcast from three friends sharing their perspectives from having years of 911 dispatch experience. Episode 25, Owls and Affairs. This week, we discuss the murder of Kathleen Peterson and possible murder of Elizabeth Ratliff, both last seen alive by Michael Peterson. Okay, so my question today is, have you ever taken a phone call for a fall down the stairs? And if so, how extensive were the injuries? I've t- Yes, so where we live, we get, get snow in the winter. And I've never taken a call of somebody that fell down like a flight of stairs or somebody not anything yeah. inside. I've taken quite a few calls of slips on ice and they've gone downstairs. Yeah. I think the worst one was it was like six or seven stairs that they actually fell down and it wasn't like a slip and fall on your butt type of thing. Like they fell down, fell those, down stairs. those stairs. Yeah. Yeah. And they were I believe unconscious for a little bit but then like while the reporting party was on the phone with me they came back too like they 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 were alert again Mm -hmm. I've never I that's probably the most severe like quote-unquote fall down the stairs even though it's because of ice but I don't think I mean I've never taken that I can recall (laughs) um like an inside fall down and or push down the stairs scenario like nobody dead at the end of a staircase kind of thing not that i can remember and i think (laughs) you think you'd remember that (laughs) i mean you would think but also who knows at this point with my brain that's true i mean like sometimes when we talk about things later on i'm like oh yeah i took a call like this yes (laughs) i forgot and it's like something super crazy yeah and you're like how could i have forgotten that and it's just like filed i think it's our brain really back part of the rolodex in there yeah and like also sometimes i think i forget things that like are troubling it's like my brain's way of protecting itself yeah it's like no we're just gonna forget that we don't we don't need somebody else's trauma exactly you have enough i was telling somebody the other day how when i started dispatching i should have started like a journal of all the crazy calls i took because one there's so many yeah. And two, stuff like that where you just don't remember. It seems like a good idea, but then it seems like it's so much work. It's a like, lot of work. I'm busy when that stuff comes in. <laughs> that's true. When the crazy stuff comes in, you're too busy. And then by the time it's over, you're just like, oh, thank God that's Ready over. Ready for it to be over. Yep. Yep. Yeah. And you're like, I can breathe for a minute. I was going to say, I don't remember taking any serious falls down the stairs. Recently, I took a fall... For, like, an elderly male subject who fell down the stairs and he was kind of injured, but I think it more had to do with his age and maybe Mm -hmm. he, like, passed out than actually, like, fell down the stairs. Mm -hmm. I've also taken one for, like, a little girl, like, a toddler who fell down the stairs and ended up on concrete, so she had, she was bleeding, but she was okay. The other day, my grandma fell down the stairs at my house and I thought that I was going to have to call 911, but she was okay. Oh my goodness. Because you've been to my house, you know how I have those, like, stairs outside? They're not really stairs. Mm -hmm. And she was walking. Oh, yeah. And the nurse in me was like, oh, no, no, we're going to have, like, head injuries. I, like, ran out there all crazy, like, ready for anything. And she was, like, fine. She had, like, a scrape on her knee, and she was okay. But I I was like, great, I'm going to have to call 911. This is going to happen. Oh, my gosh. Yeah. So today I'm going to share the story of the murder of Kathleen Peterson and the possible murder of Elizabeth Ratliff. Have you heard of them? The name sounds familiar. Catherine okay. Peterson? Yep. I'm going to send you a 911 call. Okay. I'm 911. Where's your emergency? Oh, 1810 Cedar Street, please. What's wrong? My wife had an accident. She's still breathing. What kind of accident? She's still on the stairs. She's still breathing. Please come. Is she conscious? What? Is she no. conscious? No, she's not conscious. Okay. Please. How many stairs did you what? fall down? Huh? How many it's stairs? Stairs. How many stairs? Oh. Calm down, sir. Oh. Calm down. No, uh, 15, 20, I don't know. Please, get somebody here right away. Please. Okay, somebody's right dispatching the ambulance no. while I ask you questions. It's, 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 a, it's a forest hill, okay? Please, please. Okay. So, just kind of tell me what you thought about the call. Anything that stood out to you, or was it just a normal, typical sounding? I mean, it definitely, I've 
taken calls that sounded similar, especially at the beginning of the call. The, like, that we've talked about it before, the, like, panic response of people just not listening and just, get here, get here, please, please, help, blah, blah, blah. And you're like, I, yes. <laughs> Send help now. Why isn't yeah. somebody here already? Why are you still talking to me? Why are you like, asking I, me so many questions? <laughs> it's, like, contrary to, I don't know, I'd be interested if there was, like, a giant poll that went out to like United States citizens and been like what do you think emergency communications look like do you think it's just one single solitary person that is sending medics and also talking to you on the phone because that's very unrealistic in places larger than like a hundred (laughs) people but yeah so the sure I've heard I've heard calls like that the ending seemed a little odd to me it sounded a little off I can't really put a finger on why. This is how he kind of like disappears or like the 15, 16, I don't know, 20 or whatever he says at the end. I don't remember what he said. He, which I guess technically isn't that weird because I've had people that you get the address and you say help is on the way. And then for some reason they feel the need to like either give you the address again or like he did, like give the neighborhood. Like he called it like Forest Hills or something like that. Or, like, hang up on you. I've had that happen, too. Yeah. Well, that, I think, is people's perceptions from, like, television and movies where they can just say, I need an ambulance here. And they say, okay, they're on the way. And then, like, that's all Click. the conversation consists of. <laughs> I remember watching um, Forever Ago. It was a show called Grimm. Uh, and it was, like, yeah. followed the detective through Portland or Seattle or something like that. And th- I specifically remember one episode where they needed an ambulance and he calls and calls the dispatch center and says this is detective so-and-so i need an ambulance here and then it's like okay thank you and hangs up and i'm like uh no wrong yeah they ask questions just for future reference like what do you need an ambulance for how about that like yeah like as What do I need to send? ALS, BLS, what am I doing here? Like, as me, if I was just, like, a citizen and I needed an ambulance, I would want the medics to know what they were headed in for so they could prepare while they're on the way and not be like, what do we need? Like, is it allergic reaction or is it a gunshot wound? Like, yeah. (laughs) how about some information? Did somebody get a paper cut? Or is this a serious... <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, we we laugh about it, but, I mean, we do need that information. There's a, there's a reason we ask. We laugh about it because it's so funny that it actually happens. It's very... Yeah. Anyway. Um, okay. <laughs> um, I, the end of the call sounded weird where he, like... He just sounds kind of off. He sounds off and he's, like, uh, he like he's panicking a lot, right? And yeah. then she starts to ask more questions, and that's when he, like, he, kind of peters off, and it sounds like, like, that panicking is kind of gone. Like, the the whole, I don't know, it's hard. I don't know. Obviously, there's something weird about it, right? Like, you baked it for an episode. But, but you don't know yet what it is. You might recognize the story once I start telling it. Because sometimes mm-hmm. I find that you kind of are like, oh, yeah, I saw that in the news, or oh, I, I heard that. But I like to start off. I don't know. I kind of liked how we started off the last couple episodes with like the nine one one call because you're like, "That's weird," and then yeah. you hear the story and you're like, "Oh, that's why it's weird." That's why. That's why it's weird. I think it's just the way he. Then this is such a weird thing to hone in on, but so he says it's in Forest Hills, okay? Like for some reason that sentence it doesn't sound like the rest of his panic, which is such yeah. a weird thing to hone in on. Because he's like, please, please send somebody, send somebody, please. And then, like, slows down and sounds more even and says, it's Forest Hills, okay? Please, please. I don't know. That, that, yeah. Bit, even though it's only, like, four words, sounds It just kind of sticks out because he kind of, like, sounds, like, annoyed. Or, like, like he had a, like, a, like, a list of things he want, he prepared beforehand to say. And he was like, oh, I didn't give the neighborhood. It's Forest Hills, Okay. Like, like he ha- checked he had everything it. off. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So the nine one one caller is Michael Peterson, and the the wife is Kathleen Peterson. Kathleen Peterson was an American businesswoman and a philanthropist. Philanth- 
philanthropist. Kathleen Peterson was an American businesswoman. She grew up in Lancaster, Pennsylvania, (laughs) and was the first woman to be accepted into the School of Engineering at Duke University. She would go on to take executive positions at high-profile pharmaceutical and IT companies, and in 1997, she married Michael Peterson. Michael Peterson had graduated from Duke University with a bachelor's degree in political science. He was the president of a fraternity and the editor of the student newspaper there. He also attended classes at the law school of the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. And after graduating, he took a civilian job with the U.S. Department of Defense researching arguments supporting the military involvement in Vietnam. Michael's first wife, Patricia Sue, and Michael were married and they had two children together. And in 1968, Michael was commissioned into the United States Marine Corps and served in the Vietnam War. And in 1971, he was honorably discharged after a car accident that had disabled him. Remember that. Okay. During a campaign for mayor, years later, Michael would claim he had been awarded a silver star, a bronze star with valor, and two purple hearts while he was in the Marines. He had all the medals, but he didn't have any paperwork to back it up. <laughs> sorry. Your faces. I, your faces I'm sorry. Just... I mean, like, I could not I'm say. I'm sure there's is... places on the you saying, can order them. I'm not saying that this is what happened, but, like, I could go steal an Olympic gold medal and be like, I have an Olympic gold medal. Like, that doesn't mean I am an Olympic gold medalist. <laughs> and you'd be like, yeah, it was in track, which we all know Jessica hates to run. So. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> anyway. It would come out later that he claimed the injuries sustained in his car accident were actually what happened in Vietnam, and that's why he got these medals. Hang on. What? (laughs) Yeah, so he was saying, he was telling people that the injuries that, because he had to be medically discharged is what I am gathering kind of from what I read. from 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 a car accident. From a car accident. Not from any kind of active duty kind of situation or injury. But that's what he was telling people. And that's what he was, like, saying he got these medals for, right? (laughs) His lies would publicly be revealed, causing him his campaign for mayor, as well as many friends and supporters of Michael and Kathleen. Yeah, that's pretty well documented. Yeah, like, if you're going to lie about something, maybe pick a smaller lie. Yeah, it's a littler one. (laughs) Like, I helped a lady cross the street. Like, (laughs) I'm a real hero. (laughs) (laughs) He would write three novels that he claimed were based around his experiences in Vietnam, okay. which obviously was a lie. He also worked as a newspaper columnist for the Durham Herald Sun, where his columns were known for the criticism of the police and the Durham County District Attorney, James Hardin Jr., the same prosecutor and city cops that would later handle the murder case of his wife, Kathleen. The Petersons were well known in their community and lived in pretty lavish lifestyle in their five-bedroom mansion on 3.4 acres valued at about 1.9 million dollars in 2021 that was the value of the property mainly off of her income i'm guessing i think he made some money off of his novels but yes she kind of supported the family on december 9th 2011 michael peterson placed that 911 call at 2 40 a.m He told the dispatcher that he had just found his wife, 48-year-old Kathleen Peterson, at the bottom of their stairs. He told investigators that he and Kathleen had watched a movie together that night, sitting by the pool, drinking wine for several hours afterwards, and talking. According to Peterson, Kathleen had gone to bed earlier than him because she had a meeting the next day. When he came in hours later, that's when he found her. He theorized that Kathleen slipped and fell to her death on the stairs because she was drunk and possibly had Valium as well. Because okay. apparently she had been injured before and was on medication. When police arrived at the Peterson home, they found Kathleen on the staircase, just like at the bottom of the staircase, just like he had said, and there was blood mm-hmm. everywhere. There was blood everywhere from there was her like, falling down the stairs? Yes, there was like lots of blood. Not quite the result you would expect from falling down the stairs, unless you like broke a bone so bad it like busted open your skin like normally those are like in like brute force type of injuries not not or like maybe you hit your head but so i'll I'll tell you 
a little bit more. The ME, Deborah Radish, found that Kathleen had seven deep lacerations to her scalp and the cause of death was homicide by blunt force trauma not consistent with a fall. So like when you think of a fall, you maybe you bump your head and you get one cut, right? And maybe it bleeds a lot because it's a head injury. Mm-hmm. I'm going to pull up the picture. Let me show you. It's like splattered on the wall, which it's just like, and also if you look at, it's just kind of like a weird angle for the stairs for her to fall. It, it's just, it's just weird, right? It doesn't, it doesn't mm-hmm. look right. And obviously the ME also doesn't think it looks right. Yeah. The autopsy report showed her BAC was 0.07 and 0.07 to 0.09 is mild impairment of speech, vision, coordination, and reaction times, making it dangerous to drive. So she was just borderline and that she had 5 to 15 milligrams of Valium. Valium is a benzo used to treat anxiety, alcohol withdrawal, and seizures or to treat muscle spasms and provide sedation before medical procedures. It's really not that much that she took. Like, and maybe mixing it with alcohol maybe impaired her a little bit more. Mm-hmm. But it, her BAC was really not that bad. The ME also concluded that Kathleen had died 90 minutes to two hours after sustaining the blunt force trauma injuries. So she laid there. Even if she fell down the stairs, right? Like you said. She laid there for up to two hours after falling down the stairs. And let's say she didn't. That was two hours she laid bleeding She out. just laid there bleeding there. Yeah. The police spoke to Kathleen's sister, Candace, after the murder, and she told police Michael was interesting, smart, and she had always liked him. She thought that everything was fine between Michael and Kathleen. However, she remembered Kathleen was very stressed about her job, security, and the credit card debt, college tuition bills, and the money they had lost in investments. Caitlin also told investigators she sensed the financial issues were causing problems in the marriage, which we all know from how many stories that, like... One of the top motives for murder is money. Money or an affair, right? One of the top stressors in general, finances. Yeah, that's one of the top reasons for divorce. Mm -hmm. Just 11 days after her death, on December 20th, Michael Peterson was indicted for the murder of Kathleen Peterson. He surrendered himself to police, and in a public statement he says, and I quote, Kathleen was my life. I whispered her name in my heart a thousand times. She is there, and I can't stop crying. I would never have done anything to hurt her. You're making a statement about your wife, wouldn't you? I don't know. It's just weird. It's too flowery and poetic, if you mm-hmm. ask me. Kind of mm-hmm. like it also was planned, right? Mm-hmm. Initially, all the children of Kathleen and Michael Peterson stood by Michael and declared his innocence, including two adopted daughters of Michael, Margaret and Martha Radcliffe. Remember their names. How many kids did they have? So Michael had two sons, Todd and Clayton. Clayton Peterson, and Kathleen had a daughter, Caitlin, and then they had the two adopted girls. However, as the trial proceeded, Caitlin and Kathleen's sister, Candace, broke off from the rest of the family, so Caitlin's Kathleen's daughter, and Caitlin moved out of the home and cut off all contact with the step-siblings and stepfather she'd grown up with, because as more came out, she kind of sided with prosecutors. Mm Mm-hmm. Peterson's private life was really revealed during the trial, and prosecutors attacked his credibility pointing out the lies he had made about his time in Vietnam and military service. They also revealed that Michael Peterson had been living a double life and had been using internet sites to hook up with other men. Michael would tell prosecutors that he was bisexual and that Kathleen had known that he was having sexual relations with men. Prosecutors, however, would allege the night of Kathleen's murder, she had stumbled across emails between Michael and one of the men he was having a secret relationship with, and Michael had murdered her to shut her up. Kathleen's family didn't believe that Kathleen knew about his secret affairs and believed that she would not be okay with Michael hooking up with any other people, whether it be men or women. During the trial, Brad, an escort, was called to the stand to testify that three months before Kathleen's murder, they had planned to meet to have sex. However, they never actually met up. The prosecutors alleged the amount of blood, location of the blood, and the positioning of the body and the blood showed that Kathleen was viciously attacked and beaten to death. I mean... It seems more likely than falling down the stairs. Yeah. There was also, like, drops of blood outside the house and, like, kind of inside. And then, like, there was, like, smear marks, it looked like. And he had, like, weird, like, drops of blood on his shorts. An SBI agent, Dwayne Deaver, had testified that the blood pattern at the scene suggested that Kathleen had been bludgeoned to death. 
EMT has testified that there was actually dried blood around her body when they arrived, which goes back to her sitting there for up to two hours. The prosecutors speculated that the, there was a missing blow poke from the family fireplace, and that could have been used to murder her. Prosecutors advised that there were two wine glasses on the kitchen counter, but Kathleen's fingers weren't on either of, fingerprints weren't on either of them. They also alleged there seemed to be white marks around Kathleen's body, like I said before. That also supported their theory that Michael had staged the scene and used those two hours to cover up before he called 911. Mm -hmm. Through the investigation, the details of another woman's death came out, and her name is Elizabeth Ratliff. So I guess once he was arrested and it was like made known public, people from his past called and they're like, hey, there was also this weird death that happened. Maybe you should look into it. It just seems suspicious, right? So Elizabeth Ratliff died in Germany in 1985, and for two decades, her family believed she had died of intracerebral hemorrhage, secondary to blood coagulation disorder. Elizabeth had been complaining of headaches before her death, and according to Dignity Health, an intracranial hemorrhage is bleeding inside the skull, and the blood pools in the skull and puts pressure on the brain, which can cause rapid brain damage or death. So they can die pretty quickly, right? It can be fatal and requires immediate attention, so it's like an emergency. However, Elizabeth Ratliff's body had also been found at the bottom of a staircase mm. with injuries to her head. Mm. Michael and his first mm. wife had dinner with Elizabeth and her two daughters the night before, and Michael had stayed to help Elizabeth put her children to bed before returning home. And the next morning, Ratliff's nanny found Elizabeth's body. So, like Kathleen, Michael Peterson was the last person to see her alive before she's found at the bottom of the staircase. The plot thickens. <laughs> her daughters, the adop adopted daughters, are her daughters because her husband had previously died. And so it was just her. And she was friends with the Petersons. So Michael Peterson and his wife at the time. And so Michael adopted them because she left her children to him. It's all very... Kind of strange, if you ask me. So before the trial began, the Durham court ordered the remains of Ratliff be exhumed after her daughters agreed to give consent. Her daughters said they believed in Michael's innocence and that they agreed to the exhumation because they believed it would help support his claims. Sure. Her body had been buried in Texas and the second autopsy was done in Durham and began in April of 2003. Her body was practically intact, according to Dateline. Her fingernail polish and dress were perfectly in place. The Durham ME found evidence to overturn the first autopsy findings and listed Ratliff's new cause of death as homicide. Elizabeth had also had seven lacerations to the head, and investigators were stunned by the similarities between the two women's bodies. Mm. It thickens some more. <laughs> Michael was not charged with anything for her murder, but the prosecutors were allowed to introduce the death into his current trial for Kathleen's murder as evidence that Michael had done this before, or at least been involved in something similar. Mm -hmm. The nanny who had found Elizabeth's body would testify she had spent a large portion of the day cleaning the crime scene up because there was so much blood on the wall and on the floor, although there's no note of that in the original police reports. Like, after the police showed up, she cleaned the place? Or she cleaned the place? <laughs> after. Okay. After, like, after they came and they took the body and all that stuff. But if there were large amounts of blood, it would not be consistent with... An internal like, hemorrhage? bleeding in the brain. Yeah. Like, also, she wouldn't have seven lacerations to her head, just like Kathleen. Which I'm also like, who the fuck did her investigation? You know what I mean? <laughs> Multiple friends from Germany would testify at the trial about their suspicions that Michael was involved in the death of Elizabeth, and the defense would allege that everyone knew how in love Michael and Kathleen had been, that their marriage was perfect, that he didn't have anything to do with Kathleen's death or Elizabeth's death, and the escort even testified that Michael had indicated he had a great relationship with his wife and he loved her a lot, that he wasn't interested in having anything but sex. They also called their own medical experts who alleged that Elizabeth had not been murdered but died of natural causes. They even called Dr. Henry Lee, who testified for OJ, and we talked about him in the John this Wayne guy episode. This guy again. Yeah. I'm like, at first, so I had seen him. What a couple. shitty human. <laughs> That's what I thought. I was like, I'm sorry, but what? You know what I mean? Like, 
he just takes money from people to say whatever they need him to say is how I feel. Yep. And I know he's mm-hmm. like, people think very highly of him, but that's just what I'm finding is the more I read into more cases and stuff, I'm like, are you really, do you really mean what you say or are you just taking money to say whatever they want you to say, right? I don't understand. I mean, again, this whole podcast is built off of people that, in which their morals are obviously skewed, right? <laughs> but it, especially to like, he's who you go to if you you want to convince the jury of something other than the evidence you know what i mean like does that kind of make yeah. sense that like your forensic evidence is pointing one way so we're like oh let's get the guy from oj's case because he's really good at convincing people that forensic yeah. evidence. if we can give him enough money he's gonna say that the evidence actually points to this that's so yeah. like how do you sleep at night Probably comfy uh, in your expensive I was going to say, sheets, I guess. And his, like, million-dollar home with his silk pajamas and his bunny slippers or something. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> he would testify that the amount of blood had to do with Kathleen being alive and moving around after she fell. He would also suggest that the blood on Michael's shorts was from Michael cradling Kathleen when he found her. And that there was no way Kathleen could have been beaten to death the way prosecutors allege because she had no broken bones or skull fractures, as well as no brain injuries. The defense would also bring up the alleged murder weapon, a missing blowpoke that Michael's son allegedly found three months into the trial in the basement of the Peterson home. The lead detective agreed in the cross-examination that there was no evidence that could support the blowpoke had actually been used in the crime. But also, I'm like, it was three months later, so like... Could they have found one similar or could, you know what I mean? Could they have just replaced it? The blowpoke seemed to be in pristine condition and defense attorneys believed that they had poked too many holes in the prosecutor's case and had planted too many seeds for reasonable doubt. So they were like, oh, we're good to go. There's no way. When, when they, I don't know if you'll know this, but when they called it in pristine condition, did that like match the condition of the other chimney or was it like new? It just, it looked like a normal blow poke. Like, it didn't look, there was no, like, blood. It wasn't, like, bent out of shape or, like, it just looked like a blow poke. Which I'm, like... I'm suspicious. Uh, well, wouldn't it be, like, dirty if you used it? That's my thing, is, like, I, I'm wondering if they... They either replaced it or cleaned it really well. It's, like, people's whole jobs to look into this stuff, but, like take the one that they found with the other chimney or the other fireplace equipment and be like does this have the same amount of use like is this is this different is it new has it been cleaned like yeah did they like get rid of the other one and be like oh we found our old one in the basement when it's a new one yeah which you would think they would look into that and maybe see if someone had but i mean there are the ways experts I'm, sure. I'm sure somebody <laughs> Yeah, as we say all the time, we are not experts. I mean, we're basically detectives, but we're not experts. We're not experts. Um, We sure do have a lot of opinions, though. (laughs) Yeah, I would like to um, add a little bit of, you know, like a statement here saying we have lots of opinions. This is an opinion podcast, primarily. And we just discuss (laughs) true crime, okay? Michael Peterson would not testify at his trial. However, he would speak to Dateline and multiple news sources, as well as multiple part documentary, The Staircase, that follows his trial about the charges against him. I watched that whole thing. It's, it could have been less episodes, but. (laughs) He would tell Dateline that he believed cops were, quote, delighted that this had happened because they could frame him for this. Michael also claims he knew he was bisexual when he was 11 years old. He claims he would seek out sexual encounters with men throughout his marriage, but Kathleen knew about it and didn't change the relationship between them. He said, and I quote, that Kathleen had a hunch, but they didn't ever discuss it. He said, I wish I had told her. I mean, that's one of my regrets. To which I say, like, okay, so what if you're bisexual? Like, that's not the problem I have here, but that's that's your regret, not that you killed your wife at the bottom of the staircase he's saying that she knew but then at the same time saying that like oh i think she had a hunch but he's yeah, also so she claiming didn't that really he, know that she was aware of these encounters that he was having the entire time oh but i wish i would have told her you're what pick a side dude you're contradicting yourself did she yeah. know or do you think she knew like you know what i mean like yeah 
And if you if also, she knew, why are you regretting that she didn't know? I guess it may have had more to do with the the trial, but that's not what we're looking at here. Like evidence, the evidence that you left behind has nothing to do with your sexual preferences. Yeah, and I think I mean I think he talks about it a lot because the prosecutors allege that like finances and also his like sexual encounters. Which, if you're a consenting adult and your partner knows about it, cool, do whatever, do whatever you, want. you want. But like, as long if as you're it's safe, sane, and consensual, yes, okay. yes. But if you're a partner in a marriage where the other person thinks that you guys are not seeing other people, like maybe mm-hmm. don't do that. Yeah, <laughs> you know what I mean. And then for him to say like, "Well, she knew," but she also it's. I just yeah. think it's like maybe it is part of the motive. Maybe it's not. Either way, it's bullcrap that he's trying to say she knew when she probably obviously didn't. It's cheating if she didn't know that it was happening. Yeah. And if you didn't talk about it, then she obviously didn't know it was happening. We all know how I feel about cheaters. I don't like them, okay? I just don't like them. But, like, the fact is, when you are cheating on your spouse, not only are you, like, in danger of hurting their heart. That sounds so cheesy. But you're in danger of hurting them physically because is he using protection? How many other partners has he had? Like, there's lots of questions that could have been racing through her mind. Like, those are the questions I would have. Like, am I at risk for this, this, and this? Like, you know what I mean? He then also, like, describes her as an open-minded liberal person. Like, in the same interview, it's like he's talking about her like, oh, she would just be fine with it and blah, 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 blah. And I'm like, well, she's not really here to tell us how she really felt about it. You know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah, it's weird to... it Regardless of the situation, it always makes me uncomfortable when, like, a partner or somebody makes a statement about, uh, like, a deceased person's thoughts and, like, where they would stand on something. Like, you don't know. Yeah. Like, you... And there's I nothing... feel like, regardless of your connection with them, you're not allowed to make that declaration for them. They're not there to make it, so you are not allowed to do that. Yeah, nobody should speak to anybody else's beliefs. Mm -hmm. That should only be that person, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Because it seems like he lies a lot. He lied about his medals. He lied about the reason he was discharged from the military. Like, he's just a liar. Yeah. Like, and some of the stuff I've seen, his brother comes on and he's like, oh yeah, we all knew that he liked men too. Which it's like, they kind of go over it so much because that's the prosecution's motive they say but it's not the only motive that they had right they also have this financial motive and the fact that kathleen felt like she had all this pressure and he's just this author who lost a lot of support after it came out that he lied you know what i mean yeah so where's where's all his money coming from because writers don't make a lot of money unless they like write twilight or harry potter you know what i mean yeah Thank you for listening. Additional information for each case can be found on our website, truthliesandalibis.buzzsprout.com. New episodes will be uploaded every Monday. Find us on Facebook and Instagram at truthliesandalibis.